Good afternoon. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for being here. Um, we have a lot of information to share, like Sylvia just said. Um, also want to point out that under the materials tab, we've included several resources, um, things like acronyms, definitions, and among a few others. So especially if you're new to the health center um, environment, those are really uh, great resources that, to have at your fingertips. So a little bit about ourselves, about NCFH. Well, we're a national nonprofit. We're located in Buda, which is just south of Austin, Texas. Um, we're committed to improving health status of agricultural workers and their families since 1975. And we do this through training, technical assistance, information services uh, to health centers. If you haven't visited our website, I encourage you to do so. There's many resources there to help you with the work that you do. And um, some examples are like patient education material, which is available in Spanish and English. Um, we have some great digital stories and sample forms, um, like patient registration forms, things mm -hmm. like that, and m many, many other resources. So please, if you haven't uh, visited the website, I encourage you to do so. Our learning objectives. Um, we want you to have a better understanding of migrant of the migrant health program. Um, we want to be familiar with ag worker demographics and characteristics and how that impacts health access and delivery. And then we're going to discuss some services that are provided through the migrant health program. The flow, the overall flow for today is is um, as such, we're going to start with a little, like I said, there's a lot of information, but we're going to begin with a little history. We'll talk about demographics, characteristics, um, working and living conditions, um, some service delivery aspects of it, some challenges and some solutions, and then we'll end with a brief Q&A. Um, this information is really important because as if we have a better understanding of this population that we're serving, we're able to provide better service and hopefully we'll have positive health outcomes as a result. And before we dive in, we do have a poll question. Just want to take a moment, um, a couple of poll questions to kind of get to know who's on the webinar. This first question is, which of the following healthcare settings do you work in? Migrant health, center, community health center, migrant community health center, or other health organization. So will just take, we're going to do 30 seconds, just a quick short time, and um, share the results. And currently it looks like other health organization is top of the list. I'll just give it a few more seconds. It's fluctuating quite a bit. Okay, so it looks like 47% are um, in other health organizations, and then migrant health community migrant community health center is next. Um, and then after that is community health center, and then migrant health center. So that's like 47%, 30%, 16% community health, and 7% in migrant health. Great, perfect, thank you for participating. Okay, poll question number two. How many years have you been involved in agricultural worker health? Oh, there you go. How many years have you been involved in agricultural worker health? A is zero to three years, B is four to seven years, C is seven to 11 years, and D is 11 or more years. And again, we'll just take a few seconds to get these results. Personally, because we want to know how long you've been 
um, working in the health center, health industry. So it looks like 43% for zero to three years, 24% uh, in the four to seven years, followed by 22% with 11 years or more, and last is 11% for seven to 11 years. Great, thank you for participating. That's, so it's um, some great information. It looks like most, most of us are fairly new. So, so this webinar topic is perfect for you. And um, I think it's ready to dive in here. So the Migrant Health Program. It helps to understand the program, like when it began, why it began, you know, why it's important to look at the history um, that led to the program in order to fully understand what it is. So let's see, I'm gonna go through a little history here. You know, we've had, we've been importing agricultural workers for many years, and long before the Migrant Health Act, the U.S. Has, has brought on agricultural workers from other places. But beginning in the 1850s, we had a lot of improvements in, in equipment, and so there's a lot of advances in crop production, which, which resulted in a demand for agricultural workers. Um, then we had, during World War I, you know, we had labor shortages, people were going off to war, so we had, again, more, more demand for labor. And we had um, Congress pass the Immigration and Nationality Act. And then in the 1930s, we had the Dust Bowl, which was a major drought that impacted the Southern Plains reason, re region. And we had the de Depression. All those events displaced a lot of American um, farmers and sharecroppers. They, they then became migratory workers themselves. So we had a lot of agricultural workers. And then during World War II, um, again, there was a labor shortage. And in order to meet that shortage, uh, Congress passed the Bracetto Act, which authorized temporary visas to Mexican citizens. Um, it's important. It was an important time because there's a lot of a lot of um, temporary visas that were that were um, authorized, and there was a, a long process that the workers went through uh, to to. As part of the pro, as part of the program, the pictures that you see here are were taken during this time, and they show the workers in line going and getting vaccinated. Um, you know, just a lot of detail that went through in order for them to get authorized to to be workers in the U.S. Um, agricultural industry, and that um, the Rossetto Act in itself ended in 1947. Now, in 1952, um, a new program began called the H-2A program, and that requires certification of a national labor shortage so that um, workers could be imported legally. And by the way, we still have this program. Um, as labor shortage is solved um, during this time, new problems developed. Many of the agricultural workers in the field um, were working in harsh conditions, they had low pay, um, they needed health care. And so that's what brought on the migrant health policy. And in 1962, John F. K., or, um, President John, John F. Kennedy signs the Migrant Health Act in order to address this problem. So the the purpose of the program was to provide preventative primary health care services to this population through the addition or the creation of migrant health clinics. So this program is also known as the Public Health Service Act 329. And it was very important um, as you know, part of history to have to be taking care of the agricultural workers. Um, what this what this legislation action took did was it authorized public health funds um, to provide health services and creation of small number of migrant health clinics 
Now, since then, the number of health services have increased, and so have the number of agricultural workers that we serve. And in, initially, uh, when the program first was introduced, um, only agricultural workers were served. And therefore, these migrant health clinics only were open during agricultural season. Um, this kind of created a, a community sentiment of preferential treatment to agricultural workers within the communities that these centers were at. So the government addressed this by um, making money available to health centers that were already receiving migrant health dollars so that they also served not only the agricultural workers, but they served the community as well. Let's see. Um, again, so we now have all these agricultural workers. We're addressing the problem of their needing health care. Um, we've, ex we've, com we've expanded the migrant health centers to also serve community members, to keep the community members um, being able to also uh, attend these uh, you know, health centers. And so we're seeing improvements. Um, but still, there's some challenges. You know, the health centers that are taking care of the community and health workers have, are overwhelmed and they're challenged in maintaining the focus of reaching the agricultural worker co community. So due to limited resources that are available, especially with outreach and translation and transportation and other enabling services that are needed to be able to reach this special population. So that, that is still an issue and continues to this day, even though we've seen many, many improvements. Um, in October of 1996, Congress approved the Health Center Consolidation Act. Mm -hmm. What this did was combine um, the, all of the special populations into, one, into a single section of the 330. Um, so we're taking care of community health with combined migrant health and the homeless health and a few other programs. And then more importantly, it also expands the reach to recognize the aged and disabled ag workers, which is huge um, for them to also continue to receive care. Additional milestones, um, well, in 1992, you know, as I mentioned earlier, we continue to see improvements and slowly more protection for ag workers um, is being implemented. In 1992, um, EPA had the worker protection standards, um, which protects against pesticide. We talked about the Consolidation Act, which happened in 1996. And then in 2002, um, the pres presidential initiative helped to expand and strengthen community and migrant health centers. In 2009, the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act, what that did was increased funds for capital improvement, service expansion, and added new access points. And then in 2010, we had the Affordable Care Act. And that, again, um, increased the health centers and also expanded coverage. I briefly wanted to point out this is one of your one of the resources available in the materials tab. It is a video called Keep Hope Alive: 30 Years of Migrant Health. Um, this is a great video that you can use as part of self development training, staff development training, onboarding. It helps to describe again the, his, the history of agricultural workers here in America, but it really paints a picture of the lives of this population and what they went through, and then it leading up to the creation of all of this migrant health program. It's beautifully illustrated and it's a great introduction, especially for new staff that's very that's unfamiliar with this population. So I highly encourage you to take a few minutes and look at it, or maybe during a staff meeting or a huddle. So now that we've have a little bit of background of agricultural workers. We're going to review some key characteristics, demographics. Um, we're going to review the definitions and the, the different types of ag workers that um, we serve. So 
So we'll begin with the definition of agriculture. Basically, it involves everything from prepping the soil, seeding, planting, growing, picking, packing, to transporting. There's basically three uh, major categories of our definitions of the type of agricultural worker. We have the migratory agricultural worker. They travel and they follow the harvest and they are employed within the last 24 months. A seasonal agricultural worker, they don't follow the harvest. So they may work in tomato fields um, during part of the, you know, part of the season, or during that season, and then they may work something else, such as construction during the other part of the year. And again, they must be employed uh, within the last 24 hours to be counted as a seasonal ag worker. And then the third type is the aged and disabled. It's important to note that the aged and disabled and retired ag workers also qualify for migrant health services. Um, especially staff that registers patients, you need to know this um, because health centers receive special migrant health funding. So if you have anyone that's part of the patient registration team, uh, we will be scheduling a webinar um, sometime between January and March that addresses ag worker identification and verification. So make a note of that and um, keep an eye out for that webinar. Now, this is a map that kind of, kind of state, states the different, the numbers of migrant and seasonal farm workers in the states, per, by state. So it's challenging because there's really no definitive data that can provide the exact number of agricultural workers in the US, but there are ways and methods to estimate the population. And that's what NCFH created this map and we use the Census of Agriculture and data from the National Agricultural Worker Survey um, in the methodology in coming up with these numbers. And the map illustrates the estimated number of, of migratory and seasonal workers um, using these methods. Just to highlight a few, um, California, the, the, the states in blue have the largest numbers. Uh, so California has over a million, followed by Texas, Washington, Oregon, and Florida. Now, these maps are also population estimation maps. There are two different maps. Uh, one has the number of product, crop production workers, and then the other one is animal production workers. So they're, the numbers, it's important to know, they're threshold numbers only. And they could be affected easily by current weather conditions, labor policies, things like that. Both of these maps can be accessed through the NCFH website. Um, this information is really useful in helping you estimate the number of agricultural workers um, in either crop or animal production for your service area. And it helps you to set goals um, in developing outreach plans and self-assessment activities. And I'm just going to show you real quick. This is right off our website. This is the crop production map. And you can zero in on a particular county, so Fresno. Klamath, so pretty self-explanatory, but really helpful in, in helping to plan the services that you provide. Okay, now we're getting into data and characteristics. Um, this agricultural workers data also comes from, from NAS, the National Agricultural Workers Survey, and it's all related to demographics, um, health characteristics. So the estimated population, and this, is, this information is from 2013, 2013 to 2014. Uh, surveys are conducted every year, but the results are not published on an annual basis. And I think that there will be some new data coming out um, soon. I don't have a date for you, but we can be keeping an eye out for that. But there's two, two and a half to three million um, agricultural workers in the US. The majority of them are male. Um, 
there's an estimated 25,000 children working in agriculture, and that's most likely an underestimate because the um, Inter the NAS only interviews children that are between the ages of 14 and 17 years of age. So definitely it's probably an underestimate. And also the average age is under 35, with 44% of ag workers being age 35 or, or younger. Um, most of the ag workers tend to be um, Hispanic. They, they do, we have workers from different ethnicities, different cultures, but predominantly they are Hispanic. And 80, um, 74 percent of the ag workers report speaking Spanish as their main language. The majority of them have less than eight years of education. 63% uh, are married and about 57% have children. So one of the things to keep in mind as we're looking at this information is how can we use it? How can we use these, this data um, you know, in, our, in our health centers? Um, some ideas, some things to consider. Well, if the majority of them are Spanish speakers, do we have our material? Is our material available in Spanish? Is it available in, in a low literacy level? Our staff, are they bilingual? So just some things to consider. Um, this slide talks to the, the way they're paid. The average, into, the average worker earns between $15,000 and $17,000 a year. Um, it's important to note that their income results in half to one-third less than the average American. And most of these workers they may be employed, they do not get benefits such as health insurance per se. And um, in fact, it's estimated that 65% of ag workers do not get health insurance. And 62% report not having been to a health, um, a doctor's visit in, in two years. And then 30% of agricultural worker families had a total family income below 100% of the federal poverty level. So how does this information impact their access to health care? It's something to think about. Well, they can't afford to take the time off. You know, they don't have insurance, so therefore they, they don't go out to seek preventative care is, is a couple of, are a couple of thoughts. Okay, just bear with me. We have a chat discussion. I'd like to know just what are some changes that you've seen within the um, ag worker demographics over the last one to two years within the community that you serve? Just use your, if you would, use your chat box and share those of you that have been there for uh, more than you know, a year, two years, have you noticed any changes within the ag worker population that you could share? That would be fantastic. Ways to report agricultural crime. See, I'm trying to get to my little chat. Some have been staying instead of migrating. That's yes, definitely. Some families in the community are not returning. Yes. Growing Hispanic community on Hawaiian on the island of Hawaii. Okay. Great. Yes, the number of H-2A workers is definitely increasing. Ag workers are tending to be younger. We're seeing younger ag workers. Yes, a lot of farms are choosing to use the H-2As and bring, um, and the migrant workers are staying in that area um, as opposed to traveling. And, Yes, those single men. A lot more underage between, let's see, there's no number. But yes, we're seeing younger younger agriculture workers in, in the fields. Those are great answers. Thank you so much for um, sharing. 
So moving right along. So these are, I'm going to talk a little bit about traditional patterns of mobility that agricultural workers follow as they find work. Um, now, again, as we saw from the results of the chat discussion, these have changed, but traditionally restricted circuit, uh, those, they stayed close to home. They did not travel far if they did travel. Point to point, they will, this group um, tended to move away for work, for work, but, and they set up temporary homes. That's important. For example, um, those agriculture workers that were living, that are living in the Texas-Mexico border, like the Rio Grande Valley, the families um, follow the point-to-point -point migration pattern. For example, they would, the whole family would travel to the same farm in Michigan every year. And then the third pattern is nomad, nomadic. They, they're nomads. You know, they they follow the work. Um, wherever there was work, they went, they traveled alone, and they were mostly male. Kind of arrows point to just wherever the work, they heard about work, they would go. Now, we mentioned current trends. Things have been changing over the years. Um, many of you mentioned that there are increase of, of number of H2 worker, H2A workers. Um, more employers are getting permission to hire foreigners um, for 10 months out of the year. Fewer families travel together, so we're seeing more single men. Um, and, and, um, and then you know, they just work within that. They're establishing homes in the community, and they work as seasonal workers. So definitely have been seeing some changes there. So ag worker living and working conditions. Um, let's talk a little bit about this. We know that adequate, affordable, and safe housing has been an issue and continues to be a struggle for these for agricultural workers. But we need to keep in mind that without their labor, growers cannot maintain the current production levels. So it's really important um, to, to keep this in mind. Some of the barriers or some of the reasons that um, ag workers have trouble finding homes, for example, is because a lot of the rural communities are very small. They don't have enough rental units available. Um, they might ask for a high deposit, um, and that's, they're not able to provide that. And then credit checks, almost everybody that anywhere you go to rent uh, a place to live, they require a credit check. And that you know is not possible for them. And then the other another barrier that we see frequently is that um, renters want to rent long term, and so that's not possible for this group. So finding housing is can be quite challenging for this population. Um, what we're hearing, um, what we've known is that you know, it's difficult to find, and 18% typically live in housing supplied by their employer. 54% um, of farm workers do rent housing. 28% um, find other ways of, of living, um, either in the cars, with friends, families, relatives. They might make you know, shift shelters by the fields. Um, and 31% report living in crowded shelters. Working conditions. You know, keep in mind that this kind of work is not steady. You know, it's it's not like our work that we go in Monday through Friday, eight to five. You know, it's dependent on the season. It's dependent on the weather. You know, the, what the market demands are, and the workers' hours accommodate the crops, not vice versa. So therefore, they're also paid by different methods. Um, Year-round work is not always possible due to the nature of agriculture, like I mentioned. Um, dependent on the season, the production of the crop, and the weather. On average, though, we know that um, agriculture workers work 35 weeks out of the year, and then many times six weeks doing non-farm work. They are typically employed by growers or packing firms directly, and a small percentage of them are employed by labor contractors. And workers may not be employed in agriculture when they seek care at a health center, but 
it's important to note that they can still be identified as agricultural workers if they have been employed in agriculture any time in the last two years. That's key. Working conditions. 83% um, are paid by the hour. The average um, hourly rate is $10.19. Um, another 10% are paid by piece rate. That's per box or per bushel. 4% um, are paid in other, by other methods, including salary, um, or maybe most um, often see combination of hourly and piece rate. And then the H-2A workers, is interesting to know that they do earn a little bit more um, with an average pay of 10 to $12 an hour. So, and again, I mentioned this earlier, many of these agricultural workers do not receive any benefits such as sick time or you know, unemployment insurance. So it's important to keep that in mind. Agri um, we're, this next section or slide is gonna cover occupational and environmental risks that are associated with this kind of work. It's important to note that agriculture is considered one of the three most dangerous occupations in the nation. And injuries are typically due to the machinery that's involved, the kind of nature that's involved, being out in the heat and the sun and exposure to, to um, pesticide agents. It's important for us to understand these characteristics because it also informs the services that we provide. Some of the occupational risks that we see are due to repetitive motions and heavy lifting, um, the way the work is organized, and again, um, the tools and the machinery that's used in the specific type of, the, of work that they do. Environmental risks, um, also important to keep in mind that a lot of the problems associated um, in agriculture have to do with field sanitation and again pesticide exposure and environmental risks. Um, this work a lot of the times requires one to stoop and to climb and to work in the soil with direct contact with plants and the plants put them at risk to expo for exposure to pesticides and chemicals um, that are used to cultivate the plants. So, Plants, for example, like tobacco and strawberries, they release chemicals that are toxic to humans and can cause severe allergic reactions, such as contact dermatitis. So it's important to keep these things in mind as you're, as you're talking and seeing um, these patients come in. Sanitation issues are also um, a problem because many times safe drinking water is not available or toilets, you know, there's a lack of nearby toilets available and, and hand washing facilities as well. So many times there's, there might be an irrigation ditch or runoff pond and the workers use that water to maybe rinse off, which can cause um, some, you know, them being exposed to harmful chemicals and waterborne par parasites as well. Other work-related health issues um, are heat stress. Um, we talked about equipment, falls from ladders, and um, insect, and, and we don't think about snake bites, insects, rodents, and pesticides again. So it's important to ask the type of employment that they do in order to conduct an accurate assessment of the presenting problem. The um, other illnesses that are also related to unsanitary conditions and substandard housing are like gastrointestinal diseases, intestinal parasites, urinary tract infections, conjunctivitis, lead poisoning. Um, so there's a lot of risks that are part of working agricultural. And then these are additional illnesses that they're exposed to as well. Now, we do have, there have um, been regulations that have put in place. There's three main regulations um, available. The Migrant Seasonal Agricultural Worker Protection Act that was um, passed in 1983. There's the Field Sanitation Standard, which was passed in 1987, and the Worker Protection Standard in 1992. Now it's important to rem remember that enforcement is dependent 
on the size of the farm and the entity in charge of enforcing that area. So even though there's there are regulations, sometimes they're not enforced. There's um, farm workers are excluded from these these um, acts, these other um, labor rights, uh, such as the National Labor Relations Act, um, the Fair Labor Standards Act. They're not they're not allowed to overtime pay and they're, they're not protected by some of these things that other workers are protected by. Um, so what this means is farm workers have a lot less protection than most other labor groups. They're at a much greater risk for illegal and unfair treatment, injuries and unhealthy conditions, scams, and among other risks too. So making them a very vulnerable population health and barriers to care. Now, so far we've learned a little bit about history, some demographics, some risks of the work that's involved um, and the living conditions and that there are very, very few um, regulations in place to protect them. So next we're going to look at ag worker health and the barriers that they face in getting that health care. In addition to um, the risks that are part of being in agricultural work. Um, they also have chronic conditions, like most of us, allergies, which I'm suffering with today. Um, they have asthma, hypertension, diabetes, uh, cardiovascular disease, so many chronic conditions. Um, the primary challenge here is that uh, that continuity of care and self-management. You know, if you're an agricultural worker that's traveling to different places, it's kind of hard to take care of those conditions. So that is definitely still a challenge. Mental health is also a concern with this population. And some of the contributing factors are, you know, being away from your family and traveling alone, you know, discrimination and feeling powerless and, and fear, these all contribute to, to mental health. Um, not having that support of your family. Um, agricultural workers also are reluctant to talk about mental health issues due to cultural barriers and stigma. So these things can easily be overlooked. So it's important for us to know and to be aware that this might be occurring in the, in the background and that and we should look for warning signs. So poll question three, um, what are the most prevalent health problems that you see or hear about in your healthcare setting? So what are the most prevalent health problems that you see or hear about in your healthcare setting? And you can choose more than one answer here. Um, uh, you've got A, diabetes, B, hypertension, C, asthma, infectious disease, and other. And just to let you know, um, if we don't answer your question, we will get back with you, we'll get back to you with an answer if we can't, if we can't address it here today. Okay. Looks like diabetes is at 62%. Um, hypertension is next at 23. And then other is 11%. And then 3% um, infectious and asthma at 2%. And then I'm seeing um, a lot of workers we see viral inf infections when they first arrive. Okay, Let's see if there's any other ones. You're only able to pick one. Hmm, it should let you pick more than one. But if you, if it does, it's not letting you, then just type, use your chat box and tell us which one it is. And that way we can, you know, keep it, keep that in mind. A and B, diabetes, asthma, and diabetes is a, is a very, is one that we see a lot. A and B, diabetes, hypertension. Excellent. Okay. Uh, 
allergies. Yeah, all of these, you know, there's a lot of chronic conditions. So what's important? Um, what's important to here is to kind of help them manage these chronic conditions. And we'll talk about that here in a bit. Um, this next slide has to do with the barriers to, to that prevent them from getting care. And uh, number one, you know, mobility, you know, um, not being able to get themselves to, to um, the health centers, you know, transportation. Um, a lot of times a level, the level of literacy or their limited English, they're, they're embarrassed or, or don't feel like they will be understood, so they just postpone getting care. Um, not having sick time available, you know, they are concerned with um, earning their money and, and taking care of those basic needs, so they don't want to take time off. Um, they can't afford it. You know, they, they have a limited income, and then, you know, like I mentioned earlier, a lot of them don't have health insurance. So these are all barriers um, that we should keep in mind as we see our, our agricultural worker population. Um, I have one last poll question. Which of these barriers most impacts your ag worker population? A, constant mobility, B, language limitations, C, health benefits, D, transportation issues, or E, lack of health insurance? Quickly um, type your answer or and I can share that with you. Okay, so far it looks like lack of health insurance is pretty high on the list. So, um, give it just a few more seconds. So, 42%. Um, next is transportation issues at 23%. Language limitations, 21%. And then constant mobility, 8%. And health benefits, 5%. Thank you for sharing. Uh, lack of insurance tends to, to be the winner here um, next to transportation issues. And, and like I mentioned, we'll talk a little bit about some solutions that, that we've seen health centers to, um, take into consideration. So this next slide has to do with migrant health service delivery. Um, these are the required services that are available through the migrant health program. Um, we're going to talk about some challenges and some possible strategies. I want to share this map with you. Um, these are current migrant health grantees and their satellite sites. Um, there are approximately 174 health center corporations and represent a total of 1,375 access points. Now, it's important to take note that not all of these points necessarily represent clinics that serve agricultural workers. So just keep that in mind. Um, these are identified by the source of 330 funds that they receive. So, for example, a community, health, um, a community migrant health center in Oklahoma that has about 20 sites, but they only see agricultural workers in 11 of those sites. So required services of this program. Um, these are primary care services, preventative care services, emergency, pharmacy, and ancillary. These, if you're receiving migrant health funding, these are important services that are required. So it's not uncommon for um, to have one or several centers provide basic insight services, and then they complement the care by referring the patient in need of additional services to a larger clinic within their network. Outreach and enabling services. This is, um, as we learned, this population is challenged in reaching health centers. So outreach and enabling services becomes really important. 
um, it helps to ensure that this population receives the required health services they need. Um, it helps them to um, you know, take care of their chronic conditions. And some of these services, but it's not limited to these, include case management, um, services to assist patients gain financial support for health and social services, outreach. We're seeing a lot of um, outreach groups and mobile units. Um, it also covers transportation, eligibility assistance, patient community education, coordination of care, and trans, uh, interpretation and translation services. So again, it's really important to keep in mind that these types of services are critical in increasing access to care for the ag worker population. Challenges. These are challenges that we see um, within this population. You know, a couple we mentioned culture, language as being um, some barriers or presenting barriers, but um, a lot of these have to do with healthcare operations. Um, you know, so we need to ask ourselves, how do we provide culturally competent care at all levels of the organization? How can we let, more importantly, let our patients know that we provide interpretation services to them at no cost? And how, what do we do about improving health information so that they're able to read it so it's at, at the appropriate health literacy level in both English and Spanish because they're both are critical. And how do we learn more about our patients' healthcare beliefs? Are there ways of addressing this so that it doesn't become a, a, a barrier? So these are just things to ask yourselves and, and look for ways that we can um, improve. Other system barriers that need to be explored are extended hours, weekend hours. Um, are we taking our services to where they are? Uh, and that refers to like the mobile units, which some of you are probably um, familiar with. Are we providing transportation? And how do we, more really important here is how do we equip our staff and our outreach workers to provide this information to the community so that they can access care at our health center? So we are definitely seeing improvements. We're seeing a lot of health centers say that they have additional mobile units, they have additional um, outreach workers, promotoras, um, and they have increased their hours, they've extended their hours, they're open. So definitely we're seeing improvements. So that's definitely um, a good thing, but there's always room for growth and that's what we should on a daily basis ask ourselves, how can we be better? So important considerations. Um, I mentioned continuity of care earlier. You know, that is one of the most challenging issues that we see in providing care for migratory and seasonal agricultural workers. Um, so what can we do about this? Um, as they travel and move, their chronic disease management is disrupted. And, you know, it's the nature of their work, of, of this migration cycle. So some things that we can consider is providing case management. Um, so that they are not misdiagnosed and that they don't over-medicate. Um, we also emphasize self-management of these chronic diseases that, that they have. So that's where um, community education is critical. You know, it's important to educate them, educate the, the agriculture workers on how they can manage their illness and what information they need to carry with them as they travel, um, such as records, um, while they're you know, going from place to place to work. They need to know what material to have on them um, to continue that, that um, self-management. Some service delivery solutions to consider. Well, it's very important to be aware of these unique characteristics of this population, you know, and, and we serve, um, in this case, you know, agricultural workers. Uh, we need to know, we've learned about their demographics, we've learned some characteristics. Um, what are we going to do with that information? What delivery adaptations can we make to better serve our patients that, that migrate? And are we doing everything we can to understand them and to be able to communicate better with them? Um, 
like I mentioned, I shared with you, we're seeing a lot of health centers say that they're extending their hours. That's great. Um, do we have community health workers or lay workers? Um, do we need to add more to assist in these outreach efforts? Because we know that that makes a big impact. So consider, is there anything else that we can do to improve access to care for this population? Again, that should be something at the back, you know, on our minds on a daily basis, um, thinking of ways that we can in improve. We have one last chat discussion. And that is, um, what would be helpful for you um, as you learn this population? What kinds of tools, what kinds of additional information do you think would be helpful for you? Um, what challenges do you face daily in getting to know this population? And we're always looking for ways to improve and to help you in the work that you do. So we rely on, on your feedback. So if you can um, have anything to add in the chat box, what you feel like you could use, what information, what kind of um, additional tools, that would be fantastic. Just take a few seconds and share that with us. And I'll share that with all. And I want to open it up to, so if you'll again answer that question in the chat box, I'll come back and read to it, but I'm going to move on, for, move, move on. Um, we're almost done and running out of time. I do want to point out the resource and tools that I mentioned in the beginning. We've got so many um, resources on our websites. So be sure these are just, uh, it's one of our pages. You can see different topics. Um, very easy for you to download and save to your computer. We also want to point out the National Co Cooperative Agreements. Visit their websites. Again, they have a lot of great information for everybody to use. You've probably heard about our Ag Worker Access 2020 campaign. So if you haven't um, signed up, please consider doing so and share it with your friends and family. So we have just a little bit of time for some questions. Use your chat box to type in your question.